as it comes out of the box, it really does look exquisite. These very much are an absolutely museum quality rendition of the original full-sized locomotives. Hi there to you, I hope I find you well. Welcome back to the channel. I'm Jennifer Kirk and this is Weir Yard up in the loft. And today we've got the review of an interesting locomotive and it's one that you might not immediately associate with Weir Yard. This is the Helgen 262 Manning Wardle tank locomotives in 009. Now this is going for a different gauge. It is the same scale as Weir Yard, four millimeters to the foot or 00 but it's modeling narrow gauge. And you might remember that I was bitten by the bug when a Pico very kindly sent over some of those bug box coaches. You see what I did there? And I was so impressed by them. I've been thinking ever since about an 009 layout. So when Rails of Sheffield very kindly offered to loan me a couple of the Manning Wardle 262 tank locomotives to review, well, it would have been rude not to. So a big, big thank you to Rails of Sheffield for the loan of these items. And don't forget that today's video comes to you in association with the channel sponsor, Trainomatic, makers of DCC decoders and accessories. And don't forget as well, as always, we will be doing the DCC fitting guide using the appropriate Trainomatic decoder to show you just how you too can DCC fit these locomotives. But I'm really excited to show you these, so come with me and I'll show you all about these little diminutive Manning Wardle locomotives from Helgen. Now, the locomotives that uh, Rails of Sheffield have kindly sent over, they sent two, but on their website they have nine different versions available at the time of recording this, and that does include two custom weathered examples, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about them later on. But the two models that they've sent, we've got 9962, which is uh, Number 30190 lid in lined BR black. And then over here we've got 9960 E188 Liu in southern lined green. So the one on the left represents a new build that was undertaken actually at the Festiniog Railway um, probably about 20 years or so ago. And they built a replica because none of the original Manning Wardle 262 locomotives did survive. And um, it was very successful. And it ran for a while actually with a different pattern cab to be able to get through the Minforth Tunnel. But it was turned out for a period of several weeks in this uh, kind of faux BR lift and actually I quite like it. It's something that I think plays into the hands of those of you who might want to model a narrow gauge line uh, to meet up with your double O line and maybe you want to set it somewhere in England in the BR period and it doesn't have to be a specific model of anything in particular but this locomotive gives you the opportunity to have a correct livery locomotive to match in with that kind of like if the Linton and Barnstable had survived long enough to keep running a bit like the uh, uh, Welsh Bull and Thanfair or the Vale of Rydell Railway. This particular example here though, that's an authentic livery of one of the locomotives from the 1920s into the early 1930s when the Southern Railway invested in the line, tried to make a go of it, but actually ultimately failed and the line closed in 1935. Now you can find a full history of the line online, but it's famous for the day after the last train had run, the station master at Barnstable Town placed a wreath on the buffer stop with the inscription, perchance it is not dead, but sleepeth. And actually there have been a number of different revival attempts on the Linton and Barnstable over the years, starting in around 1979, but more recently, um, they have been quite successful at starting to relay the line around Woody Bay, which is one of the stations. And uh, there's a couple of miles of track down with plans to relay an awful lot more. 
Now I've already taken the southern example out of the box and I'm going to come to that in a moment and the reason for that is that I've had this running so but no spoilers uh, let's see now how it's put together in here we've got the standard Helgen outer slide and then the cardboard inner with just tap it open there plastic insert slide it on out and it's pretty easy to release the locomotive from this just two side clips just pop out and pop out and then the locomotive is sat in the cradle just protected by a piece of plastic now down in here we've also got a bit of information about the different locomotives and I have to stress on this that these are uh, not the first batch of the locomotives. I believe it may even be the third production run of these. So I know that there's been stories going around online of things like inability to go around corners, but a lot of that has been resolved. And I've actually had these locomotives running and I've had them running on uh, a new project that I've been putting together. And I have actually been able to get these to run in a full circle without any kind of derailment. Um, but it does give you as well this little note in here which just gives you a few tips that if you are struggling with derailment there are some springs on the bogies which um, you can ease out just to uh, make it go around corners a bit easier. Now the paperwork as well, I've actually got the one from the other box here. We've got uh, a brief history of Linton and Barnstable Railway on there and also it tells you a bit as well about the the fate of these locomotives. There was also a Baldwin 242 and that is actually a forthcoming model from Helge and we have announced that here on this channel and I'm really looking forward to that as well. It might be one to add to the growing collection um, but then we've also got some information on the new build. They were all named after rivers in the area. So uh, the new build takes up that mantle and keeps it up. And we've got some idea here of the different liveries that are available. This isn't actually an exhaustive list um, because there's also some Linton and Barnstable uh, pre-Southern Railway liveries as well that are available too. On the other side, uh, just a little bit of information about lubrication and again, that sort of parts list. I and mean, when you look at that, it's amazing what a masterpiece that these are. It also tells you how to get inside the locomotive. There's just a couple of screws, well, three screws, and it is actually quite easy. I've already test done it, so I can attest that it is quite easy to get inside. One thing I will say though, if I go and dig back to the packaging, we do get some etched nameplates. I'm uh, just trying to show you those. I don't want to take these out of the packet because the packets are sealed and Rails of Sheffield do want these back. Um, but in the packet, we get the couplings. A uh, word of warning on those, you do have to remove or adapt the cow catchers to be able to get these on. Uh, there's also a couple of what look like vacuum pipes and these other pipes, I'm going to have to contact Helgen, I think, because the information on those is sketchy, to say the least. And I have actually uh, talked to another modeler who does have one of these, has had it a while. And he's not entirely sure where they go either. There's um, um, just as regarding part 82, to ease the fitting of this part, it may help to remove the indicated locators marked with the blue arrows. Um, it would be nice to know where it's supposed to go. Um, but that's the paperwork that's inside there. All of the locomotives come with the appropriate etched nameplates, that has to be said. And it's entirely up to you whether you do or don't add them to the model. And here we have the pseudo BR liveried one. And this was the replica built by the Festiniog Railway and uh, has run extensively at the Festiniog Railway. I believe it's currently out of boiler tickets, so it's certainly done at least a good 10 years, possibly longer. So you can see there out of the box, we get it with these um, very, very fine cow catchers front and back. And these are actually an etched brass part and they are firmly attached. Um, they attach with a couple of spigots that are a push fit into the buffer beam. So if you do want to add couplings, you can just see underneath there the, uh, I think it's a NEM pocket. I'm not quite sure how these uh, narrow gauge couplings work, but there is a pocket in there that they're kind of a push clip fit. Um, so obviously if you want to add couplings, you're going to have to remove those either 
one on usually the back to be able for it to pull a train or both if you are wishing to double head although I would say that actually it um, is liable to ruin some of the lines of the locomotive but as it comes out of the box it really does look exquisite Helgen have captured the outside frames of uh, these very, very well. And it just shows how narrow the track gauge really was compared to the size of these locomotives. They really were a big locomotive. And they ran on 1 foot, 11 inch and 5 eighths. Uh, so that's very nearly 2 feet, which is kind of how she's able to run on the Festiniog railway there almost but not quite the same uh, gauge but I think that she's she's got slightly wider wheel treads she will kind of uh, rock and roll but uh, stay on the track now the valve gear on this it's pretty delicate but it is exquisite and I have had these running and uh, it does work like a Swiss watch everything is smooth and silky all the valve gear works the pistons move as and when they should and really it is a lovely piece of craftsmanship it's all metal in there and um, it just it does seem to work really really well now one of the criticisms leveled against these uh, on the first batch was that the valve gear had a tendency of dismantling itself I've experienced nothing like that with these and uh, you know I had both of these running for extended periods of time both on the rolling road and on my test track layout which included a full circle and some point work well a point at least and there was no hint of stuttering on either of these locomotives now the pickups themselves as far as I can tell we've certainly got a pickup across all six driving wheels but I think there is well is some kind of a pickup mechanism on at least the front bogey there and possibly as well I think yes the rear one as well so it did run pretty flawlessly I couldn't get it to stall or stutter so really quite pleased with that a lot of this detail on it is quite delicate so when you do handle it handle it with extreme care uh, especially around the valve gear some of these covers uh, do feel I don't want to put them to the test but they do feel like you really shouldn't push them the actual drive to the locomotive wheels is interesting there appears to be two sprockets one on each of those axles and on the face of it it seems that the model is actually driven from two different axles so um, I'm guessing that takes a lot of the strain off the uh, the connecting rods um, but it does mean that it is a very silky very sure-footed performer on the track the actual front faces of these wheels despite it being inside framed are really nicely finished and looking at the driving wheels the spokes go all the way through they are completely open in there and um, the front faces are finished in black on the inner with the white tires and even the trailing and uh, front pogey wheels are really nicely done you can see there just about those front faces have the correct pattern profile now it struck me as I've been running and handling these that these very much are an absolutely museum quality rendition of the original full-sized locomotives and I think that that's been the origin of some of the uh, performance issues that people had with the initial first batch it is true to say that uh, these really don't like sharp curves that may be more traditionally associated with 009. Now I managed to get them to go round a, a two foot diameter, so that's one foot radius curves, but it did feel like I was right up to the limit of what they were comfortable doing. That said, uh, one foot radius is actually pretty good. You will get a lot of layout in the space for that. And with the things like ABC modules, which Trainomatic decoders do uh, support as well, and I'll show you one of those modules as well, it's also possible to set these up on DCC to do an out and back type layout and fully automate that. So you don't necessarily need a full circuit to be able to get the most out of these. When we look to the top of the locomotive, 
it really is exquisite the detail that you can see with the boiler correctly low slung between those tanks and a lot of pipe work I'm particularly impressed by the detail of the cab and you can see there it's flush glazed in the spectacles and uh, certainly the cab itself looks and feels like it is a metal construction, maybe etched metal. The metalwork itself looks very nice and prototypically thin, but the weight on this locomotive is a great deal. It really does feel like every available space in here has been crammed with the densest of metals to get the most adhesion possible. And it has to be said, when running it, that really comes through in both performance and uh, the manner with which it just glides around the layout. Inside the cab we've got some amazing detail, you can just about see it in there and it is actually a surprisingly roomy cab for a locomotive this small. The detail on the cab roof as well, we've got these four roof vents. These are permanently in position, they don't slide like you've seen on some other manufacturers models but they're modelled in three in the open and one in the closed position. And what that does do is it allows a really good view down into the cab to see some of that back head detail. And I just really like how it's all put together. You can also see the brake uh, standard just down in there as well. The back of the cab has these... Uh, they, they actually look quite cute in some respects, these uh, spectacles on the back of the cab, um, because in narrow gauge they do look oversized and uh, it really works well. And again, that flush glazing is so, so nicely done. There's no trace of a glazing bar or anything across the back or front of the cab. And yet that glazing in there is just perfect. The rivet detail is pretty exquisite and I, feeling this, most of the construction does appear to be metal, so it's holding that detail incredibly well. The lamps front and back come factory fitted and I did actually have to query with Helgen on these because they actually looked good enough to be working items, but they did tell me no that they're not. They've got like a it's it's like a crystalline thing in them. So they do catch the light and look like they are on from certain angles. But um, trust me, they, they don't actually work, but they are good enough. They look good enough to actually be working, even though they aren't, if that makes sense. The rest of the detail on the top, the separately applied pipe work really is exquisite. And I particularly like these uh, safety valve and uh, whistle detail on the back as well. The lining on this is straight and true, and you can see there we've got uh, at least two colours in that lining, and it is the pretty standard BR Early Crest Black with the Cycling Lion, and what would theoretically have been its BR number with the uh, 30,000 added for X Southern Railway locomotives, so we've got 30190. Now I don't actually know whether any of these would kind of clash with locomotives that did survive, but I'm guessing possibly not. Uh, we've also got the plain red lining on the cylinders at the front, and it all comes together to be a really nicely finished model. And as I said before, this BR livery is actually a golden opportunity to add a narrow gauge layout to your, your railway in a way that maybe you can create your own fictitious narrow gauge feeder line and add something really interesting to a BR era layout that doesn't necessarily have to follow a prototype. Looking to the next locomotive, I'm just gonna put that one to one side. The Southern livery for me, I really do like this. Again, the weight is really quite a lot in this. And when we open it up for the DCC fitting, you'll see just how clever the use of weight is to actually get that weight in, but without actually compromising the interior. You can see as well, we've got the same flush glazing. That green really does set these locomotives off um, and actually picks out some of the additional detail that might have been a little bit hidden on the black version. On the back, we've got the number uh, plate as well. So I'm just looking there, Southern Railway E188. And we've also got number 188 down there. What you can see here is um, because I'm now keeping this one, uh, I have modified the cow catcher just by very carefully cutting out two of the three tines in the middle. 
and that gives just enough room to be able to plug in and use the narrow gauge coupling and actually makes it a working model without actually having to fully remove that cow catcher detail. I have decided to leave the cow catcher on the front. I think uh, it might just look a bit uh, silly to uh, put a coupling there as well. The uh, Tampo printing on these with the E188 and the Southern is really, really crisp, it has to be said. And uh, even just using this as, say, a wagon load, I mean, it would be a very expensive wagon load, but you could imagine this sort of being tripped to or from works uh, from the Linton and Barnstable. Um, so you could actually justify it any on any layout, really, just about, as an item being shipped around. We've still got that same detail on the, the top of the model. And I love the way that that boiler really does look like it's a separate part down there, just like how a real steam locomotive is put together with the separate tanks and these straps that go across that just hold everything in place. Now, the domes on both of these models are finished in a kind of brass coloured paint and it does work quite well. I know we've seen experimentation from other manufacturers with this, some going for an actual metallized effect, others going with the paint. And I think that in uh, miniature model form, the painted ones, in my opinion, probably look a little bit more accurate. And it has to be said that paint doesn't necessarily scale. So what works on models might not necessarily work on full size and vice versa. And certainly in this occasion, the colour that Helgen have gone for certainly does seem to work particularly well. The lamps on these are true to Southern Railway practice and we've got red lamps instead of white but we do still have that kind of it's almost like a crystal in the middle and it really does capture the light so even though these don't have working lamps it does actually look at times like they are working. The rest of the model is pretty much the same. We've got that uh, three open, one closed effect on the cab roof. And actually on this, the color in the cab is a little bit different. And uh, I think it, it does work to bring out some more of the cab detail. We've got a kind of fawn color there, which, um, it, and the green as well. I'm loving the different colors and the sharp demarcation between them. You can see the uh, the back of the boiler there and uh, the brake standard. They are a very, very roomy cab, it has to be said, with plenty of space to put in a crew. Or if you wanted to go down uh, a sound fitting kind of route and you weren't actually confident to get the chip of your choice fitted inside the body, there is actually a lot of space in there for it. I'm just looking there at the works plate, Manning, Wardle, Leeds, 2042. That's quite a magnification when you, you look at that and think how big your TV screen or your computer monitor screen is and how big this actual model is. That is actually really nicely done. Again, the lining, look how sharp those lines are. Really nicely done, straight, true, uh, parallel to the edges, just as they should be. And again, look at that detail on the chassis, the correct joggling and the frames there. And I really love the front faces of these wheels. They just look right. And actually, this satin shade of black works particularly well as well. Uh, not too shiny, not too matte, really does bring out the detail. Again, we've got that uh, two gear drive effect and you can see the uh, springs there, which just help to center these wheels. But you can also see that there's not a huge amount of space for these bogies to swing side to side. So that's possibly one of the reasons why you should check your curves very carefully. And I believe that um, it won't go around Pico set track points, uh, but it will definitely, I can attest to, go round the radius of the Pico Streamline 009 points. Front bogey as well has a degree of swing and that is actually the spring that I talked a little bit about at the beginning that can be just eased out if it's a little bit on the tight side and causing derailments. Um, so all in all, it's a very, very nice package representation of coal there in the uh, tops of the, the bunkers on the side tanks. 
really, really nicely done. Front face of the locomotive is captured ever so well. We've got separately applied smoke box darts on there too. And because everything is metal, it just feels right. If you remember, when we did the Duchess of Athol review, I commented about just the difference in feel between metal and painted plastic. You can just feel the difference and feel that quality. Running characteristics, as I said before, were really, really good. It ran ever so smoothly and uh, it was almost like watching a Swiss watch at work. So silky smooth, both of these models were. I had them both on the rolling road and on my test layout as well. Now it's interesting actually, I should also put a word in here for the DCC Concepts rolling road. Um, I have a set of these and uh, they come with spaces that just allowed me to use the same set of rollers but cut down to the end gauge which is uh, exactly what 009 uh, will also run on. And what was interesting was that they were a perfect push fit between the double O tracks so I could actually power them up on Weir Yard using those rollers which I thought was a really great way if you haven't yet got an 009 layout to be able to a test run some of these locomotives. So really, really pleasantly surprised with that product as well. And now comes to the part where we're going to be doing the DCC fitting guide. And this locomotive requires a six pin decoder. So I've picked out the direct plug trainomatic uh, DCC decoder. And this is the one that rather than being wired, uh, ignore that, the box here came with one of each. It's the 6P and this is the standard NEM 651 type decoder. And you can see it in there with the six pins at the front. Now I'm going to put that to one side and also bring in my trusty jeweler's screwdrivers. Now in the paperwork, I'm just going to bring this back out again. It does actually give you some very clear instructions on this matter. So it shows the three screws that you need to undo. And actually one of these screws is what's holding the front bogey in. It's not actually holding the top on, but you have to remove that bogey in order to expose the screw that you need to undo. The rear screw, you can just push the bogey to one side and that gives you enough room to be able to do that. So we're gonna go ahead and do that. I'm gonna pick the uh, small crosshead screwdriver. And very carefully, uh, let's see now. Now I do wonder if it is possible I can just undo that front screw and I've actually done that without undoing this. It does recommend that you undo this screw so just bear that in mind. Uh, and then there's also a screw hidden away at the back here too. And if any of these screws do come out with something like a magnetized screw driver that I've got here, then what I tend to do is use the box of the jeweler screwdriver just to stop the carpet gods from uh, uh, taking their fill of those. And now what we need to do is to just rock the chassis and you'll find that the whole chassis pulls, just pull it straight. Don't pull one side then the other. Or what I found is it does tend to jam at the front. Now you can see in there all of that detail and also some of the back head detail as well uh, in the cab is perfectly visible here. But there's a lot of metal work in there, but there's also a good deal of space in these side tanks just to be able to uh, put various electronic gubbins. This also does mean that there's a free and easy path into the cab if you're wanting to add something like uh, stay alives, or even if you want to fit a crew this is a great point where you can glue them in in exactly the positions and poses that uh, interests you. We've also got a great deal of space here and on the other side here, which if you want to fit a sound chip is a good opportunity to hide things like speakers. Now you can see on top, this one has already been fitted by myself. I test fitted this. So you can see here the all the weight that they've managed to incorporate into the chassis. Now you'll find the circuit board and the six pin blanking plate there. And these are actually stuck down using a sticky pad. So what I recommend is that you carefully, don't put too much force on these wires. You don't want to create a dry solder joint 
Move them to one side and then with a flathead screwdriver you can just tease the whole uh, structure up and off and you can see underneath there the sticky pad that was in place holding the blanking plate and the circuit board. Now the blanking plate will just very very carefully pull out and what you can see on the circuit board there is that there is a number one on this side where my thumbs are. So that's where you want to line up pin one on the decoder with pin one on the uh, circuit board. Line them up. It is a very tight fit. Wiggle it ever so slightly and push them all the way home. There is then actually plenty of space inside the chassis. I'm actually quite impressed how roomy the innards of this locomotive are. And we can just feed the decoder and the circuit board back into place. If you need to, you can replace that sticky pad just to help hold everything in place. Although I actually find that uh, it isn't really strictly necessary. Once all that is in, we can test it if you uh, just want to make sure on the programming track and then it's simply a case of reattaching the top. As a one piece, uh, as you see here, it is remarkably easy. Uh, it's actually a joy to DCC fit a uh, locomotive like this and I really like the space that has been created in there for speakers for a full sound fitting option. And it's already making me think towards um, doing a sound fit of this loco because it's almost rude not to. So we just line that up, make sure there's no trapped wires. It goes in absolutely square. And then we just need to make sure that you get those screws back into the right place. When you put these screws in again, just like any other model, don't over tighten them. Don't imagine that you've got some kind of Wayne's World air gun and you need to tighten them to within an inch of their life. They just don't need it and you're more likely to cause damage and strip threads. But there we have it. It's as easy as that. If anything, it's one of the easiest DCC fits, and especially for a locomotive this small, I think Helgen are leading the way with all of that space in there for sound fitting as well and uh, stay alive, just so easy to fit. And this brings us now to the score. Now for finish, again, really impressed. That painted metal rather than painted plastic really brings a lot out in this model. I just can't find anything to fault, particularly. All of the paintwork is where it should be. I couldn't find anything that felt like it had been compromised. I think probably the only area might be these domes. It's so, so difficult to get brass, especially polished brass, to look right in model form. I think personally that um, this looks a little bit too dull. Um, I think it's probably borne out of the fact that there's got to be compromises made in scale. But certainly, uh, for me, that's probably the only detraction. And it's not really a major detraction. One other area was that I had to remove some of the teens on these uh, cow catchers. And I think perhaps as a compromise, it might have provided a better finish without this sort of cut metal, cut brass effect where you have to cut through in order to fit couplings. I thought that maybe fitting it with a cow catcher cut out might have been a little bit of a better option. So all in all, I was very impressed by this and I'm going to give this a 9.8 out of 10. For functionality, well, running wise, this was a lot smoother than I was expecting. I've heard people say that they can't get round corners and actually, Whilst it was a little bit picky about how steep those corners were and it wouldn't go around the tightest of corners that we've come to expect possible from 009, it did manage a full circuit of my one foot radius test track. And actually that is reasonably tight in and of itself. So it wasn't as bad as what the horror stories made out. 
The amazing weight on this meant that it was incredibly smooth, even through point work, and I saw no hints of any kind of uh, risk of derailment at all in the slightest. Both versions ran silky smooth, both on the test track and the rolling road, and really there was very little of note to fault. I think one area that if I was going to criticise this model, it is that maybe this design is too much like an exquisite museum quality model. It's a perfect rendition of the full size model in model form. And I think perhaps a few uh, compromises might have gone a long way in the chassis in order to get this to go around tighter curves. But that said, I think that's splitting hairs. Damned if you do, damned if you don't. And I'm just glad that Helgen held their nerve and produced what is actually an exquisite model. And I think an awful lot of people will overlook that inability to go around what would actually be somewhat unprototypical even for 009 curves, because it has to be remembered that this was a big locomotive with uh, outside frames, so there's not a lot of movement for these wheels to make to get round really tight corners. I don't think the real locomotives themselves would have been urged to get round super tight corners, so actually I think it's a compromise worth making. And I'm going to give this a 9.5 out of 10. For ease of use, on the DCC fitting, I was very, very impressed on these. It's actually, in some respects, it can be made easier even than the paperwork suggests for a DCC fitting. When I went in there, I was quite surprised at just how much space there is, because these are heavy locomotives, and that gives them the good running characteristics, but it hasn't been done at the compromise of leaving no space inside for the DCC decoders. In a lot of instances these days, unfortunately, we still see locomotives coming forward where DCC ready seems to almost be an afterthought. So it was a great pleasure to see that these were anything but. And the fact that inside these locomotives, they have space to easily fit a stay alive and a sound decoder with speaker. It really did impress me that all that has been done without compromise to the weight and the adhesion to the track. If anything, these should be a roadmap for other manufacturers, that you can make a model that has the adhesion weight, that does run really, really well, and still is able to fit all of those things that DCC modelers are starting to ask for, without really any compromise to anything else. So for that, I'm going to give this a 10 out of 10. When it comes to aesthetics, I really do like the look of these locomotives. The expert choice of materials that's gone together to really just make them perfect. I really like the way that the boiler itself looks like it's separate to the tanks. Even though it isn't, it does work as a visual trick. The cab as well, the very expert use of different materials to give you the thinness of what would have been sheet metal and all of that back head detail in there. I particularly like the etched brass cow catchers, although it would have been nice to perhaps have a spare in the box that would be pre-cut out and finished to allow the fitting of couplings. Other detail on the locomotive is exquisite, and I really did like the lamps front and back that looked almost like they could work. In fact, I had to check with Helgen just to make sure that it wasn't a quality control fail, because I was almost convinced that they should be working. Such was the finesse of them. The wheel profiles as well are really nicely done, and I really like these outside frames that still have an awful lot of detail on them. So again, for aesthetics, I'm going to give these a 9.9 .9 out of 10. Value for money. Well, it has to be said that the original RRP on these was shockingly high. Indeed, they were some of the most expensive locomotives, gram for gram, that I'd ever seen. However, they are currently on sale with a number of different retailers, but also Rails of Sheffield who very kindly sent these over. And we've got some links down below to take you to these examples on their website. 
and at £139, that represents nearly 50% off the original RRP. Get them whilst you can, because these are unlikely to be remade again by Helgen at a price anywhere near this. It is a great locomotive. It would work well in a display cabinet, as a wagon load, or as a narrow gauge railway in its own right. With the range of different liveries available, they've got you covered for the original Linton and Barnstable liveries, the Southern Railway liveries, and the new build BR Black liveries, and a number of different identities so that you can have any locomotive in pretty much any time period that it existed in. So there is really a great range. I was also really, really impressed with the custom weathered versions, and for an only a £10 premium, the images of these really do look exquisite. So all in all, for value for money at this special sale price, I'm going to give these a 9.0 out of 10. And that gives us a very respectable 48.2 out of 50. I have to say, I started out as a bit of a skeptic on these models. They certainly weren't a locomotive that was on my radar to buy, even though I had been turned onto the charm of 009 with those Pico bug boxes and the lure of a small England in the works for release sometime next year. So it has to be said that these models, all on their own, through the quality of their manufacture, their aesthetics, and that really, really easy DCC fit, particularly if you want to go down the Stay Alive and the Sound route, have won me over. That and nothing else. Can I recommend these? Very much. Well, I hope you found today's video informative. Don't forget to like, share and subscribe. And uh, also click that bell and you'll be the first to know about new videos as and when they go up. And you can also head on over to Patreon where you can check us out and support the channel if you so wish to, to help us continue to make the videos that you want to see. And also, of course, a big, big thank you to Rails of Sheffield for loaning us these two models today. And you can find a link down below that will take you to the Rails of Sheffield sale for these items and everything else that they've got from Helgen in the narrow gauge range. But until next time, you take really great care of yourself. This is me, Jenny Kirk, saying stay safe, happy modeling. Bye for now. Today's video is sponsored by Trainomatic, makers of DCC decoders designed to be fully compatible with every manufacturer's locomotive. Visit train-o-matic.com to browse the full range and see what they've got suitable for you. I'd like to send out a huge thanks to everybody who supports me on Patreon. And an extra special huge thanks goes out to Anthony Kidson, Michael Churchwood, Anthony Hunt, William Wade, Wayne Johns, Offshore Allen, oorail.co.uk, Tepic, Michael Lockie, Helen Sink, Peter Bolton, Brian Smith, Brian and Dorothy Mudd, Gary Lewis, David Quinn, Trish Bits, Sparky 107107, George Butterini, Andy Finch, Chris Moss, Robert Sears, MD of San Juan Model Company and Grant Line Products, Sam Yates, and Dale Williams. Thank you. Without you guys, I couldn't do this.